This is the Flipping Junkie Podcast, Episode 1. Welcome to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. My name is Danny Johnson, former software developer turned house flipper, flipping hundreds of houses. Each week, we bring you interviews, strategies, stories, and motivation to help you get started flipping houses and on your way to becoming your own boss and achieving financial freedom. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's get to it. Who is Frank Johnson? Frank Johnson's been flipping houses in South Central Texas for over 18 years. He also happens to be my dad. Yeah, he was my first mentor in this business and still helps me through tough situations and reminds me of things that I've forgotten. You know, I really feel that a lot of you out there that have been following the Flipping Junkie blog are going to find this episode extremely fascinating. Not only do we discuss how my father inspired me to start flipping houses, which led to my wife and I flipping over 200 houses and changing our lives forever, but you're also going to learn the simple house buying rule that's going to make sure every do every deal that you do will make you money. And find out what major problem arose when trying to buy 30 houses within 30 days and it wasn't buying bad deals. You know, he also shares in this episode his thoughts on what separates the people that make it in this business from the ones that don't. You know, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed interviewing my dad. Uh, be sure to visit the show notes page at flippingjunkie.com slash podcast slash Frank Johnson for more about today's show. Enjoy. All right, so today I've got Frank Johnson on the show, and uh, that's actually my dad. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, he actually taught me a lot about this business, helped me get started in it. So we're going to get uh, a lot of information out of this, and for those of you starting out, it's going to be great to hear uh, how I got started and how he helped me uh, with it. So, uh, Dad, you there? I'm here. Thank you for inviting me to be on. Hey, thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. I know the audience really appreciates it. Uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. You know, how long have you been flipping houses, uh, investing in real estate? For about eighteen years now. Man, time flies. I guess it's been eight for me, or twelve for me now. So that's yeah. So you had been flipping for about six years before I got into it. And uh, do you want to share how you got started flipping houses yourself? Well, in the beginning years ago, I used to work. Uh, rehabbing houses for other investors. I uh, quit doing that for a little while, and um, then I had a conversation with who became my mentor, another investor that I used to do rehabs for, and uh, decided to quit my job and uh, start investing in houses. All right, so you were a contractor for a, a house flipper, for a real estate investor then? Yes, for a couple of them. Yeah, for, oh, for several investors, and then yeah. So you, what did you do? You you just you know went to to one of them and said, hey, I want to get into this business. Teach, you know, can you teach me how to do it? Is that? Uh, no, actually, um, if we go all the way back to the beginning, um, who ended up being my mentor and uh, and uh, a gentleman who uh, become very very financially successful flipping houses for many years. Uh, we've stayed friends through the years, even though I I had. Uh, then he worked for him for five or six years, but we talked off and on. Uh, when I when I was doing the rehabs, I used to enjoy, it wasn't just doing the rehab part, I enjoyed the part of uh, fixing something up and having the neighbors all stop by and look and say, oh wow, this looks really neat, this is good for the neighborhood, and then other people would stop wanting to know, well, how much are they selling the house for, and I enjoyed that part, uh, showing the house and showing them all the work that we were doing, and so a lot of the houses when I rehabbed and I felt like they uh, sold real quick after we got done. Uh, so I didn't want to just be a contractor my whole life. I did eventually want to uh, start maybe flipping houses, but I never got serious about it till after having a conversation with my mentor. And uh, that's when I decided to go ahead and quit a job that I was working and uh, just give it all I had. All right. And so whenever you started, what what did you start with? I mean, what, what, was, what were some of the first things that you did to get started? I mean, obviously you had the, you know, construction background uh, about, you know, and so you p had a good idea of what repair costs would be, but uh, I'm sure there was a lot that you didn't know uh, regarding the other side of the business that, you know, the flipping, the buying the houses and finding them. So what were, what were some of the things that you, you started with when you did get started? Well, driving for dollars uh, was definitely in the beginning, uh, one of the ways of uh, trying to find houses, the, uh, 
other way with some bandit signs, which uh, I'm in a small town, and that real quickly had to uh, slow down. So I, I, uh, my mentor pretty much uh, just told me to go out there and do it. So uh, since I had worked with other investors, and I used to drive around with them years ago, looking for houses, too, in neighborhoods that we were having houses on. Uh, so I kind of had a little idea what to be looking for. Uh, and, uh, and explain for some some of the people listening don't really have a good idea of what, you know, really know what driving for dollars uh, means. Can you explain uh, what driving for dollars is? Yeah, driving for dollars essentially is looking for abandoned uh, uh, houses or houses that haven't been taken care of. The grass is tall, a lot of newspapers in the front yard. Uh, uh, probably just look for the worst houses in the neighborhood and, and uh, get their address and then uh, hunt down the uh, uh, buyers. Uh, I'm sorry, not the buyers. Hunt down the uh, people who own the property and see if they have an interest in the selling. Um, we had ads in the paper back then, too, that I, you know, we buy houses, and uh, we used to get uh, quite a bit of calls doing it that way, too. Uh, uh, I just took the payment every day. All right, and when you were were starting doing that, and you would find some houses, you would get a hold of. Uh, so you drive around, find the vacant houses, run down houses, find the owners, uh, probably through the the county assessor's uh, website, right? I mean, as far as That's where the right. tax bill was being sent, and you'd yeah, send them a letter, talk, right? Right, but you also talk to the neighbors a lot of times too, help out uh, because sometimes you know where the people might have moved or. Uh, sometimes that was actually a quicker way than, than trying to send letters and stuff like that. So, Right, and that's uh, an awesome I, point because a lot of people don't take the time to actually stop the car, get out, and go knock on the yeah, neighbor's doors. They're important, and if you're going to do that, you might as well leave a card or something there saying that you buy houses also. At the, on the vacant you. house, right? Exactly right, yep. Right, so that's that's great. You know, that's that's uh, a thing that I'm lazy about a lot of times, too. I just yeah, write down the address and drive on, and yeah, you should stop, get out. You know, especially if it's obviously vacant and been vacant for a long time, it's worth the effort. It's also worth the effort to go ahead and take a few pictures of the outside of the house with a picture of the address of the house, so that later on when you're back doing your notes or you're researching what you need to research, you have a, uh, it helps you to remember what, what the house is, and also if they call you, you also have a picture of that house on your phone, and it'll help you remember what you're talking about, too. Right, yeah, so yeah, keep all that information together. And that's one of the reasons why I developed uh, REI Mobile, but uh, that's our CRM software. Uh, so let's, so if you, you know, you found some houses, and how were you determining in the beginning how much to offer for the properties? Was that something that, that your mentor uh, helped you decide on, on what to offer? Doing rehabbing as many houses as I had rehabbed in the past, it was almost like a second nature of knowing approximately how much it would take to fix something up or at least be pretty close to it. And figuring, you know, you want to, uh, you have your profit margin that you want to make. So I used to just figure out what I thought the house would retail for and uh, minus what I uh, had to spend on it. And uh, that pretty much kind of told me what I wanted to pay for it. Right, and you you have uh, sort of an ability to, to determine retail values, uh, just sort of an innate ability. But you also sort of, you know you know you market very well in, in the different houses and what they sell for, and that might be a little bit different in smaller towns, uh, where you you do have a good idea of what types of house will sell for for what amounts. And I've always been blown away by you know you don't often ask for comps or determine value from realtors or anything like that. You sort of just know the market. And I've always been kind of blown away by that. And I'll, you know, I'll run comps and, and figure out what I think it'll sell for based exactly on comps and everything, and then ask you your opinion. And usually, it's really close. It's amazing. I don't know how you do it, but uh, that's you know what knowing your market. That's how that helped you. But so you you knew what the the houses would sell for, had a good idea of what they would sell for. You had a good idea of what the repair costs would be, and your profit margins. Uh, were you always using something like the 70% of ARV less the cost of repairs to determine what you would offer? Um, well, that would be the highest amount. Uh, you know, I really try to have a little bit better profit margin. I guess one of the rules of thumbs that I was taught in the very beginning, too, is don't ever buy something that you can't turn around and flip to somebody else. Uh, and so in, in saying that, I always try to go on the lower end of of uh, what I'm offering, and uh, 
my worst case scenario, which you never really ever got to that, but it was always at my worst case scenario, and so I would just flip it to somebody else, make a couple thousand dollars, and move on. But I never had to do that. So. All right, and uh, you know, so most people go through a long period of doubting whether they're going to be able to flip houses, or that what they hear about other people flipping houses, the, the things that they do, the buying the houses real cheap and fixing them up and selling them for a big profit. You know, they they kind of have that period of doubt where they don't know if that's really something that they can do in their market or if that many people really do it. Um, and so there's that doubt, you, you know, it can be difficult to get the ball rolling in this business. So you, you sort of deal with that. Almost everybody will deal with that in the beginning. And so when you first got started, you know, what moment did you realize that you're actually going to be able to succeed, you know, at this business? What was that aha moment for you? Well, uh, there again, go back when I decided to quit my job, uh, I had this thing that I told myself, this failure is not an option, and I know what point A is, and I know what point C is, but for a while there, I didn't know what point B was, meaning I knew that I had to quit my job and at least start doing it, and point C would be successful at it, and if failure wasn't an option, there was no question that I wouldn't be successful at it, I just had to uh, work and work harder and even harder at it to, uh, to make it work, and so I didn't, I guess I didn't Thinking about not making it wasn't there. It, uh, it was, I didn't allow myself to even think about not doing it. And I also learned later, uh, earlier on that, uh, finding houses to flip is like we look at it for needles in a haystack. But the one thing I know, I knew then and I know even today is there are always needles in the haystack. So you just have to keep moving the hair until you finally find them. So. Right. And so I guess. I and so I'm sure that helped you, and that, that probably helped me, too. I know I still had a little bit of doubt that I would be able to find them because we're in different markets. Uh, you know, we don't invest in the same market. But, um, you know, so your, you know, your mentor and you, you knew other investors that you had done work for rehabbing the houses for them. So you had seen firsthand and knew that they were finding these deals. So you had that already had that faith that you'd be able to find them as well because you saw them finding them and knew that you would be able to also, right? Correct. Yeah, that was yeah that was the other side of it, too. But uh, when I first started uh, rehabbing houses, when the crash was years ago, uh, and so I've seen people there becoming very successful when, the, when, that, when other people were losing money. Uh, these people uh, were making money picking up what these people were losing. So uh, even that just showed me, too, that you know, it just depends on how you... How you look at it all, um, uh, there, you, I guess there again, if you just keep hunting enough times, you're going to find it, and you have to yeah. believe in yourself, knowing that you're going to make it. So, yeah, and I think hearing about people, even when you hear firsthand, you talk to people in your local market about them finding great deals, and you've never really actually found one yourself. You sort of still wonder if you'd be able to, or, or that there's any good deals left, all that kind of thing. Um, and it takes a while to get that first deal, but I know, you know, as a matter of fact, like you, as soon as you get that first deal, like the second one is usually shortly, you know, it doesn't take long after getting the first one to get the second one, and the third one's usually even faster. So it's really, a lot, you know, yeah. most people quit before they ever get that first one. No, so it's, it's just a, a matter of getting that first first deal, and most people give up before then, so they don't know that getting the first one and getting the second one usually comes quicker, and then you just... You know. Oh yeah! Once you get once you get the ball rolling, and and you just have to keep it rolling. And but once you actually do get it to roll, which is your very first deal, that, that's the first part of it all. Um, yeah, it, it moves quicker and quicker and quicker. So, so it's like everything else. You just become more comfortable in it. And so and and also you're learning from all your mistakes. Uh, you're learning from your mistakes, trying to find it. It's like I'm wasting my time doing this, or I might be wasting my time doing something else, and I'm not getting a lot of results from. It. So as the months go by and then as the years go by, you keep learning uh, better ways to do what you're doing. And, and also the market's constantly changing. It's never the same. There's new rules, new regulations. Uh, so you always have to be constantly changing with the times, too, and keeping yourself up with what's going and which way the market's going. And uh, you can't be lazy about that. You have to stay on top of that. But, yeah, you, once you get the first one down, and after that it gets easier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And so do you have a single piece of advice that you would give others just starting out in the business to help them succeed? You know, sort of like, you know, one piece of inspirational knowledge or something that would 
would help people to succeed in flipping houses? Well, I said a little bit earlier, number one, just really believe in yourself and believe that you can do it. And that, if you uh, stay diligent enough, uh, there's no question that you'll be able to find a house to, to buy and sell. Um, the, the other thing is, um, uh, as you remember, there's um, the finding house is like finding a needle in the haystack, and I can't say that enough. It's there. You just have to look hard enough to find it. Right, and so the point, you know, is, is having faith that you can do it because I think so many people just, you know, they hear that and they say, oh, well, well, you know, sure, whatever, you know, but they don't really take it to heart because really you really have to believe. Other people people have done it and you can do it and just know that you can do it and don't give up until you do. And that's what you were saying before whenever right. you, you would sink or swim, like you were just going to make yeah. it happen no matter what. You're going to have to just track here and there and uh you know, look at what you were doing, see what was working, see what wasn't, but you never doubted that you were going to do it. And, and that's, that's huge. You know, a lot of people have so much doubt and it's hard to not have doubt when you haven't experienced it yourself, but uh, to have the faith and work through to get that first deal like we talked about. And then you'll understand, you know, the power of faith once you have it. Cause that, and I think that's a lot of the reason why people get their second, and third deals so much quicker than the first one is because then they have the faith, you know, they've, or they don't need as much faith because they've experienced it, knew that they could do it. But um, so you know, you flip houses in smaller towns. We were just talking about how we have we're sort of in di- different markets, and I flip houses in San Antonio, which is a pretty big city, and you flip in the smaller towns outside of San Antonio. Uh, do you feel that there's a big difference between investing in, in the smaller towns uh, versus uh, investing in big city? Uh, I think there was, but you know, the market is ever changing. And, and starting where I started at, you know, 18 years ago in, in the little towns that I started in, uh, they've changed a lot now. And so uh, I think that our marketing now in these smaller towns are starting to uh, come up to about probably or close to what y'all are doing in bigger cities. But in the very beginning in smaller towns, uh, number one, you usually have less competition. Uh, from other investors. Um, so I think that kind of helped out too. I think a lot of people used to be scared of small towns, and there's a lot to think about in investing in small towns. But I have some towns that only have, uh, well, I had one of them, the school district was the biggest employer. I had another one that had a uh, chicken plant in it, and uh, it was closed down for a while. As a matter of fact, the first year I went into that town, I said I'd probably never buy in this town. Then they opened the chicken plant up, and so when they opened the chicken plant up, we decided, hey, let's just go ahead and start buying a few of them and see what happens, and we ended up with a decent amount of houses in that town at one time. Um, so, you know, there are some, but usually you can get better deals and your profit margins are a lot bigger when you're taking a little bit of more of a risk like that in smaller towns. Uh, the bigger towns, though, you have a lot more opportunity to sell houses. Uh, you're... you're you're dealing with a lot more investors and the deals might be a little bit harder to find because you have a lot more competition finding them. Uh, But uh, it's a whole lot easier to sell because you have more people uh, in that area wanting to buy. Right, so it's that constant trade-off, right? Yeah. Yeah. One good good thing here is is, uh, trades off another good thing there. Uh, but and there again, like I said, markets are constantly changing. I mean, we've had a lot of growth now in the last uh, seven or eight years where I'm at now. I mean, there's a lot. I have a lot more competition with people buying properties now. Uh, before it, who who did you wholesale a house to? There wasn't another investor. So if I bought one and wholesale it to another investor, I didn't have other investors. Like in San Antonio, there's a lot of investors that uh, put wholesale deals, and and uh, I didn't have that option so much. Um, Actually, even when I started, it was me and I had one other person, uh, two other people that I know of uh, during that time. That was the only ones when we started that were actually doing it. Uh, and then we had the flood of 99, which kind of ch- changed things up a little bit, too. And uh, So you had uh, more, helped- more investors like popped up back when the floods were happening, oh. when there were deals to be had? Yeah, yeah a lot of investors came in and... and uh, but there again, you know, I had already been working in the market a little bit here, and I, I probably understood the market a little more than others uh, back then. And um, uh, I know I was the first one to uh, 
buy a home that had been flooded, rehab it, put it on the market, and actually sell it. Uh, I think I pretty much had that done before anybody else, uh, which was a proven point to me and helped me to go ahead and invest and buy other houses that had been flooded because then I realized, well, even though there had been a flood here, people are still willing to uh, buy houses that have been rehabbed and uh, buy flood insurance and try it again. So uh, mm-hmm. that, that was helpful. Right. So, so the, the whole small town, uh, investing, you know, do you feel like it it made it, uh, easier for you to be a lot more conservative whenever you bought because of the differences in the markets and how they can change? Like you were saying, if you have like one major employer that really supports the town and then something happens with that employer, then you've got trouble, uh, because the the town basically dies. I mean, so you, you know, do you think that taught you to, to always sort of be conservative with your numbers? Correct. Be very conservative. And, and, and uh, I guess if everything is booming and everything is good, then I, I think a lot of people won't take a lot more risk. But uh, you always have to think about the day when it's not booming and where you're going to be adding that property at that time. And, of course, there's a lot of difference between just buying a house and flipping it or buying a house to keep as a rental. Um and if you're doing any owner financing, uh, you're married to the paper, and what happens 10 years from now if something were to happen uh, if chicken plant closed and, and right. you're going to note to a house, the guy don't have a job, and there's nobody else to sell the house to if you take it back. So those are some of the risks that you have to take. So if you're not into the house very much in the beginning, after 10 years you should own uh, or have nothing of your own money left in it, so the rest would be profit no matter what. Right, and I, I think your being conservative with the numbers had, had helped me to become conservative with the numbers. And even with high competition, I feel like I'm still a lot of times being really pretty conservative. And, you know, the takeaway with that is, you know, I might lose some deals because I'm being conservative, but of the ones that I get, my profits are usually much better than, than other people's. And, and you know, sometimes people are kind of blown away sometimes whenever I'm able to wholesale a deal even and make a, a pretty good amount on them you know, 15, 20,000. And I would have never made that had I not been so conservative. You know, so there's a trade-off of, of uh, you know, being conservative, maybe losing some deals. But on the other side, you never have the home runs if you if you don't make really low offers. And, uh, well, and, to, and here's the other side of it, too. There's only so many hours in a day. And, you know, if you're going to keep spending all your time making deals that you're making little profits, you're working really hard. Uh, and trying to accomplish what you might accomplish out of just buying that one house that makes the profit that the three or four other houses would have made, you're going to right. end up, I think, in the long run farther ahead because you have more time to find the better deals. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. And then to know that, you know, there's an art to, to making the deals, you know, to whenever you do mo- uh, you know, marketing to motivated sellers and dealing directly with sellers when you're buying these deals. Uh, to where a lot of times it doesn't even just boil down to the the price that you're offering. You know, even if you have competition, sometimes people, you know, will will like you more and just want to sell to you, even if somebody else offered more money, but they just didn't like that person. So there's, yeah, there's an art to it, and I think people sort of develop their their uh, style and their ability to to make those deals happen over time. But let's let's talk well, a little bit. Go ahead. Again, look, can I go back to something there? Sure. The difference between a small town and a big town, too, is we have one HEB and we have one Walmart. And I go shopping at Walmart and HEB, and I see a lot of people that I've done business with that know me on my first name basis. And, and uh, so I've always have been a man of my word when it comes to if I say I'm going to do it, I do it. Um, and once you get that kind of a reputation in small towns compared to big towns, because big towns, you know, there's a whole bunch of people there, and it's not like you all are shopping at the same place to see everybody and you right. soccer team games and with kids and all that other stuff. So uh, that, that's a big difference here, too, is, is you get back into how I've had a lot of realtors call me at the last minute. They've had a deal that fell through, and the bank just wants to get, get rid of the property after all, and they knew that if I said I would do something, I would do it. So I got the phone call, which I guess you could still do that in a big town, too, but uh, right. I've made a lot of deals just because of that alone. If I said I'd do it, I did it. Yeah, no, that is huge. And, and even in a big town, I mean, if you're, you know, I think, you know, sometimes whole, a lot of times with wholesalers, I think if, if wholesalers 
put a house under contract and then fail to close on it. It doesn't take a whole lot of those for word to get around about that. So maybe not so much in the entire community, but as far as among other investors in town, you know, you, you've always got to like make sure that, you know, you're limiting your risk so that you're getting a deal at a good enough price that you're going to be able to do something with it and be able to do exactly what you said you were going to. And, you know, you've always told me as well, it's like if you ever agreed to buy a house and, you know, you, you've, you've made the decision, made the offer, and then later you thought, well, maybe I'm paying a little bit too much, you know, you still have to close on that house. You know, and you still do the deal because you gave your word that you were going to. And if you lose a little bit of money, that's your lesson. And, uh, and you know, with these deals, too, a lot of times, you know, with what we're, you know, usually it's more of a matter of not making as much profit as you hoped than it is of losing money. Uh, but that's when you yeah, know your numbers pretty well. But Yeah, well, that one, and you're right. I mean, uh, so you don't make as much as you thought you'd make. But if you did the right thing, that's all that really mattered in the end anyway. So Right. All right, and so let's. I wanted to talk a little bit about whenever I got started. I know a lot of people, you know, that have followed Flipping Junkie for a long time, um, would are interested in finding out how I got started and, and our relationship with learning how to flip houses. And I've always sort of been under the assumption that people would think, well, you know, if your dad was flipping houses, it was easy for you because he just told you to do this, this, and this, and then do this, and basically held my hand through everything. And uh, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case. But uh, you know, to start with. Do you remember what you thought when I told you I wanted to st- uh, start flipping houses? Like, how did you feel about that? Uh, yeah, it was uh, sweet and sour. Um, or sour and sweet, however you want to say it. Uh, well, you thought I was going to take all the good deals from you, right? No, not at all. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> They're in two different markets, you know. Right. Uh, but no, uh, I was real happy and glad that you did because I know that, uh, man, I've had a great life doing it. I'm glad that. I was real happy because, uh, you know, I traveled a lot. And, uh, my job didn't own me. Uh, I owned my job, if that made any sense. I could turn it off or turn it on whenever I wanted to. And, and uh, but I guess I had another side of me since, uh, wow, you know, went through school and everything else. And uh, <laughs> maybe you should stick that out for a while because I knew, I knew that you were good at what you were doing for what you went to school for. So, but, um I guess so really and truly I was I was actually glad that you did do it and I guess it probably that sell you things like uh, I know he's successful for what he went to school in and, and I hope he can do the same for flipping houses but um, he worked with my mentor for a little while in the very beginning and then he was an awesome mentor so and right. I already knew that you had enough common sense uh, so I don't know I, I guess just sort of split uh, you know, the, a day or two of a thought or here or there. But after that, I, I didn't have any more doubts that you couldn't make it. And uh, right. And so what you and, were referring to is I had gone to school, you know, I had received a degree in computer science and I was doing software development work and making really good money doing it. So I guess your concern was more of that I would, you know, leave that security and, you know, go out there and try to make a go of, of that and uh, flipping houses and, and then, you know, you know, where there's some risk and things instead of the secure job that I had. Is that what you're yeah, referring to? I, well, I knew the risk, but I also knew what my conviction, my conviction was. Uh, uh, I knew that when I started, the day I knew that I started doing this was the day I knew I was going to be successful at it. So uh, I can even go a little bit farther. I, I, I really felt this is what I was supposed to do in life, and... Um, uh, it didn't take very long at all the first year to realize that it was a lot more than just me doing this job. Um, I really feel I've been blessed by God in, in this change of life that I made when I started flipping houses, and I still believe that today. Uh, because, man, I did I, I bought a lot of houses real quick in the beginning, and uh, it was just amazing. Actually, my goal that I had for the year was met by my second month. So, wow. <laughs> pretty crazy the first deal I ever wrote and you go back and look at that contract but my friend had me convinced that if I did anything wrong I'd end up in prison and of course the last thing I ever wanted to do is do something wrong and end up in prison but I also uh, was was told to uh, I was I was given a helping hand a lot but uh, I was also pretty much told to figure it all out too so 
just like I taught you in a way is I didn't hold your hand and, and walk you through every little thing. I just, you know, had you go out there and uh, was just available to answer all the questions. If you had questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And so you were a self-learner too. Um, right, and that's what I remember. I remember, you know, you telling me to, to learn the ropes, you know, and I, you know, I went out and I did the research just like most people do. I got online and I started, you know, um, uh, visiting websites like Creative Real Estate Online and things like that and and would just study people. You know, there was, uh, Steve Cook was on there and I remember reading a lot of his posts and um, he ended up starting uh, FlippingHomes.com, you know, several years back whenever I was getting started. But I would read his post on, on Creative Real Estate Investing Online and... Uh, I would even search his name and just search for all the things because I, you can see like through the posts when he was asking beginner questions and then getting experience and going through the whole thing. So it's really neat to see that. But I learned a lot that I could learn, you know, online and, and through, you know, courses, uh, you know, buying a couple courses and, and studying all of that. And then, you know, the, the real learning begins and it began for me whenever I started taking action. So when I did the marketing and, uh, you know, getting calls and I would still, even though I studied and got the basics from courses and reading online and things like that, a lot of it I didn't remember. And I don't think a lot of people do remember until they experience it by taking action and actually having a case where something came up and they needed to know the answer or what to do. So, you know, I, I did do some, some studying and everything, but really once I started putting the marketing out there to get the phone calls is when my real education began. And that's what was really helpful because if I had a question I didn't know the answer to, I would just say, I, I don't know the answer. Let me figure it out. I'll call you back. And then I would call call you and ask you, and then you would help me with the, the proper answer. So that was that was uh, the biggest help. And, and um, I still remember, do you remember whenever I got that first contract on the, on the first house? Well, what, it, what had happened was, you know, I had, you know, we got the contract on the house, and I remember knowing, like, okay, I've got to get this to the title company. And, you know, my wife and I went and super excited, super nervous, like more nervous than excited, I think, and, and went to the title company. And we were in the parking lot of the title company, and I called you, and I said, I just realized I have no idea what I'm supposed to say when I go into this title company with this signed contract. Like, do you remember that? I, I don't know. I remember calling and saying, I'm sitting here. I don't know what I'm supposed to say when I go in there with this. You yeah, know, it's like, I what? I probably told you you need to go in there and find out which one of their closers do the most amount of closings, and that closer that you wanted to use. Right, and then you and then even, that? yeah, yeah, you know that's that's absolutely true because there's a lot of closers that, you know, haven't dealt with creative real estate, and this was just a normal deal. But even so, like you want to get the really experienced uh, closer, especially the one that does work with other investors, it makes your life so much easier. But but oh, what I was true. what I was. Yeah, what I was calling you and asking you about was like the exact wording. What was I supposed to say, you know, whenever I go up into the title company? And it was, you know, even just the, the matter of, of saying, you know, I need to have this uh, contract receded. And, you know, you'd have to have the closer's name and figure out who's going to handle the closing and then give them the earnest money check. But, you know, I just thought that was funny that, you know, you know a lot of people try to prepare for every thing that might happen, every possible scenario and you're never going to. And the fact that I even went out and got a contract before I even knew what to say when I took it to the title company would, you know, speaks to the fact that you, you know, obviously you don't want to go out there and, and make offers when you're not sure of what the values are and things like that. But whenever it comes to understanding every possible scenario from rehabbing a house and selling it and all that kind of stuff, you know, you yeah, don't well, need to well, concern yourself so much with that. Yeah, well, what's interesting uh, really in saying this is, is in the beginning, I guess, I had somebody to call and you had somebody to call. And uh, if, if uh, somebody's first starting uh, uh, investing, they, they really do need, uh, you know, like uh, a group of people that they can be a part of or that they can uh, uh, ask questions, you know, some senior investors, how, how would they handle certain things. In other words, when you're in the moment, you need to have somebody to to be able to call you no, absolutely. in that moment to right. get that answer. The few investors that I've known in the past that overanalyzed everything aren't in business anymore. Uh, and they didn't stay in business very long because they tried to figure everything out and they never got anything done. Right. Uh, yeah, well, so, they're trying to figure out how much baseboard they're going to need for the third bedroom. 
The other investors yeah. already got it under contract, taking it over to the title company. Yes, and then you know, uh, if you remember me telling you about uh, how many deals I got when the phone rang and I decided not to eat dinner at that moment and go check the house out, and I'd be walking out with a contractor when the other investor was showing up. So, you yeah. know, if you get the hot deal, <laughs> you better go after it right then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You spend so much time, so much energy trying to find the needle in the haystack, like you were saying, that whenever you get that call, wow, you better go and, and take care of it, you know, well, schedule and get right point. over there. Exactly right, because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So. Right. Uh, and, and usually when your seller's calling you, they're nervous, too. And usually and your sellers uh, are looking for help, really. Um, they, 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 they usually have a problem. They need somebody to help them solve that problem. The sooner you can help them solve that problem, the more at ease they're going to be, and the whole deal is going to end up being a better deal for everybody because you've just solved their problem and they've solved your problem because you now got another house. So, yeah, so the takeaway with all of this is basically that, you know, you've got to surround yourself. You've got to be getting out there. And, and I know I'm, I'm pretty much an introvert. You know, I'll, I'll say that first. And I, I think that you're probably a little bit more of an introvert than an extrovert. And, um, you know, it's funny that we are both that way. And, well, I think so. I don't know. I, I don't know if you view yourself as an introvert or an extrovert. But, you know, whenever it came time to meet with sellers, you know, of course, I was always nervous at first. But after a while, man, you you know, it, it just felt so comfortable. Like it was something that wasn't that difficult. And you find out more about yourself, I think. And, um, yeah, once, and when once it, you get a couple... Once you get a couple of your deals under your belt, then yeah, then then it becomes uh, exciting. Actually, and, you know, I I love my job and I love meeting people to uh, uh, buy houses from. Uh, man, it's just a, an excitement out of this world. Um, I, I guess it's you know every day waking up and wait. You know, I can't wait to get out of the bed because I just I'm excited for the next day and, and uh, uh, finding the next uh, the deal and. Uh, but you do have to get the first couple of them under your belt before you start feeling at ease. And the more you feel at ease, the more you're going to help your uh, sellers to feel at ease too. Right. Yeah, that's huge. I think that is. There's a. I think yeah that that absolutely uh, plays a big part of it because it, you know if you think about what you're doing, you're going over there and saying I'm going to pay cash and buy your house. But if you don't seem confident and you're not able to convince them that you're confident of that, it's it's going to be. You know, if it's not a conscious decision, a subconscious decision to, to worry about going with your offer. But, um, yeah, and, and then also, you know, being introvert, extrovert kind of thing. You know, some people think, well, I, I don't know if I could do that business because of going out there and talking to people. I just not my kind of thing. But whenever it comes to something that you're passionate about, you have so much fun doing it. Like you're talking about, you know, flipping houses. Like, you know, you really just you can't even shut us up when it comes to talking about flipping houses. We're just so excited about it all the time. And you know how, you know, I always told you my kids would always, you know, tell me that I was obsessed with houses. And, uh, you know, it's true, you know, you know we've all, we've, we're all ex obsessed with houses because it's an awesome and fun business. But uh, to move on a little bit, what, you know, what do you think the biggest mistake that you've made in this business and, and how can others avoid it? Have you, do you have something like that that you could share? I have two of them, and they come from two different uh, areas of this business. Um, one of them is uh, I, I knew somebody from buying and selling houses, and I did business with this person on a daily basis. Uh, they put, they had to, they needed to sell their house and because they didn't want to create any problems with a bunch of realtors in town. They asked me if I'd have an interest in buying it, and I said, sure. So I went over there, and I seen the outside of it. Uh, but I, I didn't see the inside. I was basing my thought on what I would pay for this house or the way this person did business. I mean, I, I felt that, you know, uh, anyway, make a long story short, uh, we seen the house the day we closed on it. After we closed on it, and I walked into it, and it was like, oh, my God, what did I just do? <laughs> so, uh, in other words, I bought a house that needed a whole lot of repair, and I, I never looked at the inside of it. I just I just assumed it was a certain way. So my biggest mistake was buying a house assuming something. Uh, right, and so you saw so, the outside of the house before you agreed to buy it but didn't see the inside? Didn't see the inside. So 
Um, I could probably get away with that now after doing it for so many years and doing so many houses. But in the beginning, I just I highly do not recommend ever doing that because you don't, you, there's so many things that yeah. could be wrong you don't know about. Bad foundation is one of the biggest ones. Uh, the other the other mistake that I made for me was at one point I said I wonder if I could buy thirty houses in thirty days. And I got to my 16th or 17th one on my 16th or 17th day. And I had realized at that point, because my daughter had brought it to my attention, that you can buy all these houses you want, but you can't manage them all because all of these houses need to be rehabbed. And, and I wasn't wholesaling. I was rehabbing. And so it wasn't probably my biggest mistake, but it could have been had I not stopped and paid attention to what my daughter had to say because it was right. 16 houses in 16 days was a lot of rehabs that were going to have to happen. And there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of everything going on. So it's all right to have big goals, but be careful. Uh, and when you realize that your goal might be too big to back off of it and say it's probably not better to do it. Right, and I think the other thing with goals like that is whenever you're, when you're making it a goal of number of houses versus amount of profit, Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, maybe some people will pay more for houses than they should just to try to meet their goal, right? You know, where you pay a little bit more just because you need that deal. You did 16, 16 days or something, so 17, 17 days, you might pay more that next time to try to keep it going, right? Yeah, well, you could fall into that, but I've always warned against that, and uh, I still warn against that, and I even keep a check on myself about that because it gets back into the same thing. My worst case scenario, can I flip this today to somebody else? So it has to be a good enough deal to be able to do it. Yeah, so that's um, an awesome way to limit your, your risk because if you're looking at it, like if I offer this amount, could I close on this, turn around and call somebody, or even before you close on it, can I call somebody, another investor, and would they pay more and buy it from me? You know, so that you always have an out. So if you have too many rehabs going or you get a better deal that you'd rather rehab, then you could sell that one to another investor and make a profit. Right. And also in buying rental houses, is if you stick to your same uh, philosophy about buying flippers, uh, you'll end up making a lot more profits too, because you're buying rental properties at a cheaper price instead of not basing on uh, how much I make over 30 years or anything else. You know, I don't figure that way. I I figure mine be paid off a lot sooner than that, and so uh, it's pretty neat to get it into a house knowing that five, seven years later it's paid for the rest of your life at your profit. Or at that point, if you're tired of it, you just turn around and sell it to somebody else and now you've made all this profit by just waiting. So it gets back into just paying a cheap price for stuff. Right. So are there any unusual deals that stand out in your mind that, that you could tell us about? Unusual deals? Yeah, yeah. Something uh, that maybe a deal that was really out of the ordinary. Yes, I bought the hospital that my wife was born in. Really? And it's a part <laughs> it's apartments now. So <laughs> that's probably one of the most unusual deals I have done. Uh I've done all kinds. I mean we've done I've moved houses, I bought land and split it up and moved houses on it. Um uh, Well the hospital deal, the uh, house the, the apartments of the hospitals, like how did how did that deal how did you find that deal? Uh actually Do you it's in a small town, and, and, and uh, people know that uh, this is uh, where I used to go to just to relax for the weekend, and, and uh, they knew that I bought and sold houses. And so somebody who had some rental houses and stuff down there called me uh, called me up and, and asked if I had interested that he didn't want to be a landlord anymore. And, and, uh, and part of the unit that he had, this hospital, was part of it. Um hmm. And there again, knowing knowing my market, this is a small town, and there was no other investors in that town or even near that town. So I knew that I could make a really low ball offer and probably get it if this guy was serious about getting out of it. And I think he was to the point in life where he was serious about it. He just wanted to retire. So I made a super low ball offer and actually got it. And I uh, got all, all those properties in that deal. Um, and... Uh, uh, that's probably my uh, most unusual deal that I ever made. But uh. so you know, you've also you've you know you've helped quite a few people, a lot of people in our family, and also in other just other people, friends and, and acquaintances, you know, get started in the business, you know, by giving them advice and sort of mentoring them. You know, did have you noticed a common trait 
or something that the people that became successful at flipping houses had that the others that didn't become successful or didn't ever make a go of it? You know, was there Actually, a difference that you noticed? Yes, there is. Uh, just like me in the beginning when I was mentored and just like you, uh, if you had required me to hold your hand, I would have never held your hand, and which means you would have never been successful. So, so yeah, the one trait is, is the people who are making it or are going to make it are the ones who are willing to, uh, well, actually, just become excited about it. I mean, they... Um, uh, they're, they're go-getters. They uh, actually get out there and figure it out. They don't sit around and wait. Uh, right, right. They, they, I even they, made it a point now to where when people ask me to help them, if I decide it's something that I might want to do, I say, sure, but I'm not going to hold your hand in this deal. And then uh, I make it a point when they call me the first time after that first meeting, I don't even answer their call. I purposely don't do that to see if they're actually going to turn around and call me back the meeting again. And if they yeah, call me back point. again the next day or the next hour, then I know that they're probably going to be serious now. If they don't call me back, and a lot of them didn't call me back the second time. And I also have to tell people a lot of times that, hey, I'm really busy. If I don't get back with you, if I, even if I don't answer, at least leave me a message and, and I'll get back with you later on. Don't be offended if I cut you off real short, which you know in this business, sometimes you can get really busy. And so, um, mm -hmm. uh, and people who can handle that, they don't have to be. I call it baby fat. Uh, you don't, I don't have to worry about hurting your feelings. And I know that you don't worry about me being hurt by when you say, hey, Dad, i got to go. i got a deal I'm working on. And, and so those are the, the people who are, to me, successful in this business are people who are uh, sure of themselves and, and uh, aren't scared to try. All right. And I've experienced the same thing. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's amazing how many people will beg you to help them out and then expect you to be contacting them and telling them what to do and when to do it, and then you never hear from it. It's just, it's absolutely, absolutely insane. So it's cool that you've developed sort of the filter on that to, to you know, people have to prove that they want it so bad that they're going to work really hard. And um, and like you and, said, and you know, the ones that will come up with things and not have to wait for, you know, it's like, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. That's the type of person I think that makes it more in this business than the one that can't come up with something to try on their own. Uh, kind of like finding contractors, um, and in the very beginning, when you're you're new at investing in property, go get a contractor. He says it wants twenty thousand dollars to rehab something, and you call your mentor up and say, "Well, what do you think this guy wants to charge me twenty thousand And that person says, "Oh, that's way too much." Your mentor says, "No, you should only be paying ten thousand and so that you're having to call. 10 contractors before you finally find the one contractor with the great references who's willing to do the work for the $10,000. A lot of people get tired of it and they just give up and don't even try anymore. Uh, the person right. who's become successful is the one who keeps doing it. Right. Yeah, and that's that's really important, you know, and, and especially with the contractors, like people feel uh, that you know, after a while, after talking to so many of them, that maybe the the type of contract that they need just doesn't exist where they are, and and they end up hiring the wrong one. And that's a quick way out of this business because the, you know, a lot of times if you're not managing contractors or having the right contractor, it can make your life miserable. So, uh, do you find the same to be true that when you when you're doing really well in this business because you've got good contractors working with you? All right. Well, Dad, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the call with me and uh, to share information with the audience, the, all the Flipping Junkie listeners. Uh, I think it's an awesome episode, and, and I think people get a lot out of it, especially the ones that are starting out and uh, that might have that doubt about whether they're actually able to, to do it in this business. Uh, so thanks for taking the time. No problem. Have a great day. All right. You too. Thank you so much for listening to the Flipping Junkie podcast. I've got a lot of awesome interviews with some amazing guests lined up, and I can't wait for you to hear them. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast right now and visit the blog at flippingjunkie.com for more awesome house flipping education. All right, it's time to get out there and flip some houses. I'll see you next time.